Good morning. This is the second part of your reading for today. Chapter 44 of Black Beauty. We just heard about Jerry on election day being really kind to this woman um, and giving her a ride to the hospital. And then another woman who offered to um, possibly give him a job if things don't work out for him um, being a cab driver. Chapter 44 is what we're going to be reading next, which is Old Captain and His Successor. Now, Captain, remember, is the old horse, old war horse that Jerry has. And successor means the one who comes after. So that is a hint, just that title alone, of what's going to happen next. So Captain and I were great friends. He was a noble old fellow. Did I present my, oh, I'm so sorry. Um, it's been a long day. So I totally forgot to present it over to this screen. Captain and I were great friends. He was a noble old fellow and he was very good company. I never thought that he would have to leave his home and go down the hill, but his turn came and this was how it happened. I was not there, but I heard all about it. He and Jerry had taken a party to the great railway station over London Bridge and were coming back somewhere between the bridge and the monument. When Jerry saw a brewer's empty dray coming along drawn by two powerful horses. The drayman was lashing his horses with his heavy whip. The dray was light, and they started off at a furious rate. The man had no control over them, and the street was full of traffic. Um, one young girl was knocked down and run over, and the next minute they dashed up against our cab. Both the wheels were torn off, and the cab was thrown over. Just a moment. I thought I had a little note about what a dray is. One moment. So it's a truck or cart for delivering beer ba barrels or other heavy loads, um, typically pretty um, low on sides. So they are driving furiously. Now Captain was dragged down, the shaft splintered, and one of them ran into his side. Jerry too was thrown, but was only bruised. Nobody could tell how he escaped. He always said it was a miracle. When poor Captain was got up, he was found to be very much cut and knocked about. He's already an old horse, so it's harder for him to recover from these things. But he had something go right into his side. He's cut and knocked about. Jerry led him home very gently, and a sad sight it was to see the blood soaking into his white coat and dropping from his side and shoulder. The drayman was proved to be very drunk, the one driving that, the dray cart. And he was fined, and the brewer had to pay damages to our master. But there was no one to pay damages to poor Captain. Now, Jerry is the master they're referring to. Jerry gets paid for the damages done to his horse, but the horse, nobody's going to be able to actually have him recover fully. The farrier and Jerry did the best they could to ease his pain and make him comfortable. The fly had to be mended and for several days I did not go out and Jerry earned nothing. The first time we went to the stand after the accident, the governor came up to hear how Captain was. I'll never get over it, said Jerry, at least not for my work, so the farrier said this morning. He says he may do for carting and that sort of work. That is, the rough work that Ginger ended up being in. That would be terrible for poor Captain have to have to be a cart horse. Carting indeed. I've seen what horses come to at that work round London. I only wish all the drunkards could be put into a lunatic asylum instead of being allowed to run foul of sober people. If they would break their own bones and smash their own carts and lame their own horses, that would be their own affair. It would still be bad, but at least it's their own horse. And we might let them alone, but it seems to me that the innocent are the ones that always suffer. Innocent captain, he didn't do anything. And then they talk about compensation, which means payment back. You can't make compensation. There's all the trouble and vexation and loss of time besides losing a good horse that's like an old friend. It's nonsense talking of compensation. He means you can't put a price on captain's life. 
just because they're going to pay him for Captain being injured doesn't make it better. If there's one devil that I should like to see in the bottomless pit more than another, it's the drink devil, he says. He means those who get drunk and have actions like this that other people um, are really hurt over. Just like, um, oh, I'm blanking on the character's name. Reuben Smith, right? Just like Reuben Smith. That's the reason um, that Black Beauty ended up being in a really terrible situation for a while. Now he's with Jerry, but um, Reuben Smith also killed himself and his whole family suffered because of that. I say, Jerry, said the governor, you are treading pretty hard on my toes, you know. I'm not so good as you are. More shame to me. I wish I was. Now the governor, he drinks too much as well. And so he's saying, I think you're kind of saying this of me. Well, said Jerry, why don't you cut with it, governor? Meaning stop drinking altogether. You are too good a man to be the slave of such a thing. I'm a great fool, Jerry, but I tried once for two days and I thought I should have died. How did you do? So governor, he's really addicted to it. This is sad because he can't go even two days without drinking. That controls his life. That's what it means by him being a slave to it. I had hard work at it for several weeks. You see, I never did get drunk, but I found that it was not that I was not my own master. Meaning he wasn't in control of his actions. It was the drinking that controlled his mind and what he was doing. And that when the craving came on, it was hard to work to say no. I saw that one of us must knock under the drink devil or Jerry Barker. And I said that it should not be Jerry Barker, God helping me. But it was a struggle and I wanted all the help I could get. For till I tried to break the habit, I did not know how strong it really was. But then Polly took such pains that I should have good food. And when the craving came on, I used to get a cup of coffee or some peppermint or read a bit in my book. And that was a help to me. Sometimes I had to say over and over to myself, give up the drink or lose your soul. Give up the drink or break Polly's heart. But thanks be to God and my dear wife. My chains were broken, and now for 10 years, I have not tasted a drop and never wish for it. Good for Jerry. He realized how it was starting to control his life, and it was difficult, but he stopped altogether. And for 10 years, he hasn't had it and never wishes for it. I have a great mind to try at it, said Grant. Grant is the same man governor that we've been hearing about. For tis a poor thing not to be one's own master. You don't want something else to control you. You want to be able to think clearly and um, be responsible for your own actions. Do, Governor, do. You'll never repent it. And what a help it would be to some of the poor fellows in our rank if they saw you do without it. I know there's two or three would like to keep out of that tavern if they could. At first, Captain seemed to do well, but he was a very old horse. And it was only his wonderful constitution and Jerry's care that had kept him up at the cab work so long. Now he broke down very much. The farrier said he might mend up enough to sell for a few pounds, but Jerry said, no, a few pounds got by selling a good old servant into hard work and misery would canker all the rest of his money. And he thought the kindest thing he could do for the fine old fellow would be to put a sure bullet through his head and then he would never suffer more. Once again, really hard to see that that's the best option, but it is much better than him going on to life like Ginger was. She was becoming more and more miserable. She wanted to die because she was old and still having to work so hard in such pain. For he did not know where to find a kind master for the rest of his days. The day... After this was decided, Harry took me to the forge for some new shoes. When I returned, Captain was gone. I and the family all felt it very much. Everybody loved Captain. Jerry had now to look out for another horse, and he soon heard of one through an acquaintance who was under groom in a nobleman's stables. He was a valuable young horse, but he had run away, smashed into another carriage, flung his lordship out, and so cut and blemished himself 
that he was no longer fit for a gentleman's stables. And the coachman had orders to look round and sell him as well as he could. Sounds kind of like a ginger situation. I can do with high spirits, said Jerry, if a horse is not vicious or hard mouth. There is not a bit of vice in him, said the man. His mouth is very tender, and I think myself that was the cause of the accident. Just like Ginger, tender mouth, and so it was easy to hurt her, and then she would lash out. And I think myself that was the cause of the accident. You see, he had just been clipped, and the weather was bad, and he had not had exercise enough. And when he did go out, he was as full of spring as a balloon. Our governor, the coachman, I mean, had him harnessed in as tight and strong as he could with the martingale and the check rein, a very sharp curb and the reins put in at the bottom bar. So all of the sudden he goes from not getting out, not having exercise to having all of these things holding him up in a certain way. It is my belief that it made the horse mad, meaning crazy, being tender in the mouth and so full of spirit. Likely enough, I'll come and see him, said Jerry. The next day, Hotspur, that was his name, came home. He was a fine brown horse with a white hair in him, without a white hair in him, sorry. As tall as Captain, with a very handsome head and only five years old. I gave him a friendly greeting by way of good fellowship, but did not ask him any questions. The first night he was very restless. Instead of lying down, he kept jerking his halter rope up and down through the ring and knocking the block about against the manger till I could not sleep. However, the next day, after five or six hours in the cab, he came in quiet and sensible. Jerry patted and talked to him a good deal, and very soon they understood each other. And Jerry said that with an easy bit and plenty of work, he would be as gentle as a lamb and that it was an ill wind that blew nobody good. For if his lordship had lost a hundred guinea favorite, the cabman had gained a good horse with all his strength in him. So basically, you know, it all worked out pretty well because Jerry was able to calm him. Do you remember back when we were first hearing about Ginger's story that we heard um, a, a good man, or what was it? A ill till I think it was an ill-tempered man will never produce a good horse. So it's somebody like Jerry who's calm and patient and knows what's really good for the horse, who's actually going to make him mind and start to calm down and be a really good horse. Hotspur thought it a great come down to be a cab horse and was disgusted at standing in the rank, but he confessed to me at the end of the week that an easy mouth and a free head made up for a great deal. So even though it doesn't seem as proper, he's okay with doing cab work because he's able to move about and be comfortable. And after all, the work was not so degrading as having one's head and tail fastened to each other at the saddle. In fact, he settled in well and Jerry liked him very much. Well, Jerry knows how to train a horse well, just like John. Um, so we are going to stop there. There's just one more chapter until the end of this part of the story. And I'll give you a hint, every time we have changed the part of the story, it's because there is a new home. So what do you think is gonna happen with this next part? You'll see Wednesday, we're gonna finish up this part, not the whole book, but we're getting very close to finishing the whole book. Okay, I will talk to you all later. Enjoy the rest of your day.